Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. We're covering another international case this evening, heading over to the UK to talk about Mary Flora Bell, a little girl who endured a very rough childhood and wound up becoming a child killer. This is another story where the question of nature versus nurture really just lingers in the back of your mind. Could things have been different if only Mary had had a different upbringing or if she was able to get help? Or was there something just evil in this little girl? We'll also talk about our sentencing and where Mary Bell is today. Tonight's episode is sponsored by Mystic Hippie Studios. Negative energy got you stuck at a low vibration? Want to investigate alternative healing and explore your spirituality? Mystic Hippie Studios offers a variety of crystals, herbs, candles, books, and other gifts. They invite you to master your own ascension, free your spirit, and engage with the universe, all from the comfort of your own home. Visit mystichippiestudios.com and enter code MHS15 at checkout for 15% off your first order. And they're pleased to offer their customers free shipping. So head to mystichippiestudios.com. Peace, love, and happy shopping! All right, let's jump in. We'll start with Miss Mary Flora Bell herself, born on May 26, 1957, to a woman named Betty. We don't actually ever really know who Mary's father is, but a man named Billy Bell kind of stepped into the role, if you want to call it that. He was basically who Mary called her father, but he married Betty when Mary was just a baby, so we don't really know. Billy was a criminal who was later detained for armed burglary, and her mom, Betty, worked as a prostitute, so great role models there. Actually, her mom, Betty, was only 17 when she had Mary, and to say that she didn't want her is an understatement. The Bell family lived in the slums, a very impoverished area in the west end of Newcastle called Scottswood, and the family dynamic was toxic. Betty was mentally unstable, she was an alcoholic, and like I said, she also worked as a prostitute, so she was never really home with her daughter. Which, I mean, really must have been a great little breather for Mary because Betty made it very clear that she did not love or want Mary. In fact, multiple family members and witnesses recall Betty attempting to murder Mary at the age of only two or three years old. On one occasion, Betty accidentally, quote-unquote, threw Mary out of a window. She later said it was an accident and Mary just fell out, but there were people there who saw her intentionally toss the baby out the window. Mary sustained severe brain damage after her fall, which frankly is kind of important to take note of once we start talking about what would happen later in her life. The prefrontal cortex of her brain, that area that's related to controlled activities and the capacity of decision-making, it was damaged. Although that could, of course, also be due to all of the other horrible abuse little Mary had to suffer. In another incident, it was said that Betty gave her an excessive amount of sleeping pills, hoping that she would never wake up. There was also a reported incident of Betty choking Mary, but not being able to completely go through with it to the point of killing her. How Mary ever remained in the custody of Betty is beyond me, especially since these instances were documented. Beyond the attempted murder, Betty would also force Mary to take part in prostitution. So yeah, Mary had to endure a very traumatic childhood, and I don't say this necessarily to make you feel bad for her so that any of her actions are justified, but it just really can't be ignored. Particularly because we're talking about a child whose brain has not fully formed. All of these experiences would have completely changed the way that her brain operated. What's really sad is that all of this was documented and nothing was done. And at some point, Mary, she had to go to school. Her teachers said that she was a very pretty little girl with dark hair and piercing eyes. She was also said to be quite intelligent, but she got into a lot of serious trouble. She became known as a chronic liar and was disruptive in the classroom, prone to violent outbursts even. 
She had attempted to strangle other students and even put out a cigarette on the cheek of one young girl, which also makes me question like where the hell did she get this cigarette? I know times were different back then and kids could literally buy smokes at the store, no question. But man, like w w was she smoking as well? Mary would frequently talk about her desire to hurt people. And again, nothing was done. We have a child who has been abused. It's all documented. And now she's showing very alarming behavior. Kids, they get into trouble all the time. But Mary, she pushed the limits and took it too far. Yet nothing is done. She may have gotten a timeout here or there, maybe a detention, a slap on the wrist, but Mary isn't offered any further help, particularly no mental help. Her best friend is a 13-year-old girl who lived nearby by the name of Norma Bell. They've got the same last name, but no relation. Now, Norma was described as being a little bit slow intellectually. She likely had a learning disability and she was very easily influenced. Norma absolutely loved following Mary around, and this was a combination of her being both smitten and terrified of her. So already you can see where we have a recipe for disaster. Mary, a natural born leader who has been traumatized since birth and is now displaying violent tendencies, and then her best friend Norma, who is ready to do whatever Mary tells her to do. Of course, there's likely more than what we'll ever know, but the first incident reported where these two young girls stepped way over the line happens when Mary tries to strangle a local girl and then suffocate her by filling her mouth with sand. Literally, picture this. Norma, who is 13 and larger than Mary, is holding the little girl down while Mary is filling this little girl's mouth with sand, shoving it into her mouth and then down the back of her throat, trying to suffocate her. Thankfully, the little girl somehow managed to get away, and she runs home to tell her mother. The incident is reported to police, but as is a common theme here, nothing is done about it. On May 11, 1968, a three-year-old boy was found behind some empty sheds near a pub. He was bleeding from a head injury. He was supposedly found by Marianne Norma, who said that he had fallen off a ledge and landed several feet below. Mary would later admit to having pushed him over the edge, but again, nothing is done. And in fact, the following day on May 12th, the mothers of three young girls went to the police station and informed them that Mary had attacked and choked their children too. One of the girls said Mary put her hands around my neck and squeezed hard. The girl took her hands off my neck and she did the same to Susan. Norma was brought into the police station and interviewed as well, and she stated that Mary went to the other girl and said, what happens if you choke someone? Do they die? Then Mary put both hands around the girl's throat and squeezed. The girl started to go purple. Then Norma said she ran off and left Mary, stating, I'm not friends with her now. Mary was also interviewed by authorities and basically just told to not ever do it again, but no juvenile charges were filed. Police obviously didn't take any of this very seriously. They likely figured that Mary was just a child and how bad could it get? And then, I mean, we have to note that the area that Mary lived in at the time was a very economically depressed neighborhood. There was lots of crime, the police had bigger issues to deal with, so maybe they just didn't have time to deal with Mary. We're also talking about a time when not a lot was known about the development of potential child killers. It's all really sad because the signs were there. They were there. They were obvious. They were documented. Mary needed serious mental help and nothing was done about it. All of this could have been prevented and it wasn't. So without any real consequences or mental help, Mary was about to step things up several notches. On May 25th, two boys playing in an old abandoned house found the body of four-year-old Martin Brown. His body was discovered lying in an upstairs bedroom. Police couldn't initially figure out what had happened to him. There was no obvious signs to point to a cause of death. 
There was, however, an empty bottle of painkillers on the floor near the body. So they assumed that Martin had gotten into the pills, swallowed them, and died. Because they didn't have the knowledge or technology to dig any deeper into this, his death was ruled an accident. Near his body, police found a note that read, I murder so that I may come back. But they didn't believe it necessarily had any connection. Which to me, I'm like, what? If this was an accidental overdose, why would a note that talks about murder be found near the body? But yeah, they collected the evidence and they pretty much closed the case, saying it was an accident. Remember, this is a small neighborhood. So Mary and Norma, they knew Martin and his family. And it's reported that they would ask his family members really strange, creepy questions. They were just completely inappropriate. They would ask things like, do you miss Martin and do you cry for him? But they didn't ask it in a concerning way. They would sort of smile and giggle and they were just all too interested in the story. Now the following day on May 26th, Mary was playing over at Norma's house. When Norma's father walked into the bedroom, he found Mary on top of Norma choking her. So not even her closest friend, Norma, was to be spared from this violence. And it's clear to see how Norma would be afraid of Mary. Instead of really doing anything about it, Norma's father slapped Mary on the face and then sent her home to her parents. To her parents that don't really care about her or show her any attention. So clearly there were no consequences. Later that day, police discovered that a local nursery school had been vandalized with a bunch of horrible writing on the walls. Now, I hate using these words. Seriously, I apologize in advance. I'm going to try to be careful here, um, but it, it, there's some pretty disturbing stuff written. It was clear that whoever wrote these things couldn't really spell. The writing was very childish and messy. Some of what was written said, Fuck off, we murder, watch out, Fanny and F-A-G-G-O-T. By the way, fuck was spelled with an H, so there's that. More writing said, we did murder Martin Brown, fuck off, you bastard. Police didn't know if there was any truth to this, or if this was just some random punk kind of messing around, so again, they didn't really look into it any further. Four days later, Mary Bell showed up at Martin Brown's house. He had been deceased for about a week now. While Mary went to his mother's door, rang the doorbell, and when the mom answered, she asked if she could see Martin. At first, Martin's mother thought maybe she was just confused because Mary knew that Martin was dead, or maybe she just didn't really understand how death worked. So she gently reminded Mary that Martin had died, to which Mary replied, Oh, I know he's dead. I wanted to see him in his coffin. <sighs> Martin's mother, I mean, she was appalled. She slammed the door in Mary's face and she would later say, I was just speechless that such a young child should want to see a dead baby and I just slammed the door on her. And with all of this morbid, twisted behavior, still no connection was made between Martin's death and Mary's violence. Mary was even going around telling her fellow classmates that she had killed Martin. But because she was known to lie and fib and exaggerate, nobody believed her. And then at school, Mary drew a picture in her notebook of a child in the same pose that Martin Brown had been found, with a bottle lying near him with the word tablet written on it. Then there was a man walking towards the child, or what looked like a man. Beside this drawing in the notebook, it read, on Saturday, I was in the house, and my mom sent me to ask Norma if she would come up the top with me. We went up and came down at Margaret's Road, and there were crowds of people beside an old house. I asked what was the matter. There had been a boy who had just laid down and died. On May 31st, a newly installed burglar alarm at the vandalized nursery school brought police rushing back to the scene when it went off because somebody was there. When police got there, they found Mary and Norma loitering beside the building. Both girls denied any involvement in the previous break-in, and they were released to the custody of their parents. Again, it was pushed no further. It would be two months later, after this last break-in at the nursery school, when three-year-old Brian Howe would go missing. 
Brian always played close to home, but he was nowhere to be seen that evening. His older sister Pat was worried about him because he should have been home by now. Even writing this, I struggle because I get that times were different, but wow, to allow a three-year-old to play outside alone, especially with all of the weird ongoings, like another child turning up dead just two months earlier and the vandalizing at the nursery school, I don't really get why his parents or how his parents would allow him to play outside by himself, but they did. Either way, Mary and Norma, they offered to help Pat to search for her little brother. They literally went with Pat, going through the neighborhood, searching different spots, all the while knowing exactly where Brian was. At one point, Mary pointed to some large concrete blocks and said he might be playing behind the blocks or between them. Oh no, he never goes there, insisted Norma. In fact, Brian was lying dead between those blocks, and Mary was so morbid that she had wanted Pat to go over and discover her dead brother. Norma would later say, because she wanted Pat Howe to have a shock, but Pat decided to leave. Just after 11 p.m. later that night, police would find little Brian's body. He had been strangled, His legs and stomach had been mutilated with a razor and a pair of scissors, and there was an M carved across his abdomen. The scissors were also used to cut off some of his hair, which was scattered around him and on him. What was strange about the ligature marks on his neck was that it seemed whoever had done this did it with very little force, meaning they were either very weak or it could have been a child. Inspector James Dobson said there was a terrible playfulness about it, a terrible gentleness, if you like, and somehow the playfulness of it made it more rather than less terrifying. I know I personally have started to really open up and explore my own spirituality, and it can be difficult. Lately, I've been feeling kind of like I'm going through a spiritual awakening, which will be amazing once I get through it, but man, I've been needing some assistance, some guidance. Say hello to Mystic Hippie Studios. Mystic Hippie Studios offers a variety of crystals, herbs, candles, and books, along with other great gifts. They invite you to master your own ascension, free your spirit, and engage with the universe, all from the comfort of your own home. Whether you're just getting started with spirituality or you're looking to deepen your practice, they have everything you need. Visit mystichippiestudio.com and enter code MHS15 at checkout for 15% off your order. And they're pleased to offer all of their customers free shipping. That's mystichippiestudios.com. I also have the link in my show notes. Make sure you use code MHS15 at checkout for 15% off your first order. Now back to our story. So police, they started to question children in the area and they noticed that two little girls in particular were acting really odd. Norma seemed to be excited when she was talking about the murder and she kept smiling and she just acted like it was one big joke. And Mary, well, she refused to answer questions. She became very evasive and just didn't want to talk about it. Eventually, Mary started opening up a bit and she claimed that she had seen an older boy abusing Brian the day that he was murdered and that he had been playing with scissors. The problem was that the boy that Mary named, he had an alibi. He was at the airport during the time frame of Brian's murder, so it couldn't have been him. Also, her comment about the scissors was odd. Knowledge of scissors being involved in the murder wasn't released to the public. So Mary had kind of implicated herself because she knew this confidential information about the murder. The scissors would have been something that likely only the killer themselves would have known. Norma soon broke down too, and she told police that Mary had killed Brian. She said that Mary told her, I squeezed his neck and pushed up his lungs, that's how you kill them. Keep your nose dry and don't tell anybody. 
and when she saw Brian, Norma knew he was dead. She would say, his lips were purple. Mary ran her fingers along his lips. She said she had enjoyed it. Of course, Mary denied everything, saying, I'm making no statements. I have made lots of statements. It's always me you come for. Norma's a liar. She always tries to get me into trouble. Then Mary agreed to make a statement, and I have it here now to read to you. The following is Mary Bell's official statement. I, Mary Flora Bell, wish to make a statement. I want someone to write down what I have to say. I have been told that I need not say anything unless I wish to do so, but that whatever I say may be given in evidence. Signed, Mary F. Bell. Now here it goes. Brian was in his front street, and me and Norma were walking along towards him. We walked past him, and Norma says, Are you coming to the shop, Brian? And I says, Norma, you've got no money. How can you go to the shop? Where are you getting it from? She says, Nebby, which means keep your nose clean. Little Brian followed, and Norma says, walk up in front. I wanted Brian to go home, but Norma kept coughing so Brian wouldn't hear us. We went down Cross Hill Road with Brian still in front of us. There was this colored boy, and Norma tried to start a fight with him. She said, darky, whitewash, it's time you get washed. The big brother came out and hit her. She shouted, how way, put your dukes up. The lad walked away and looked at her as though she was daft. We went beside Dixon's shop and climbed over the railings. I mean, through a hole and over the railway. Then I said, Norma, where are you going? And Norma said, do you know that little pool where the tadpoles are? When we got there, there was a big, long tank with a big, round hole with little holes around it. Norma says to Brian, are you coming in here? Because there's a lady coming on the 82 and she's got boxes of sweets in that. We all got inside, then Brian started crying, and Norma asked him if he had a sore throat. She started to squeeze his throat, and he started to cry. She said, this isn't where the lady comes, it's over there, by them big blocks. We went over to the blocks, and she says, you'll have to lie down. And he laid down beside the blocks where he was found. Norma says, put your neck up, and he did. Then she got hold of his neck and said, put it down. She started to feel up and down his neck. She squeezed it hard. You could tell it was hard because her fingertips were going white. Brian was struggling and I was pulling her shoulders, but she went mad. I was pulling her chin up, but she screamed at me. By this time, she had banged Brian's head on some wood or corner of wood, and Brian was lying senseless. His face was all white and blue, and his eyes were open. His lips were purplish and had all, like, a slaver on it. It turned into something like fluff. Norma covered him up and I said, Norma, I've got nothing to do with this. I should tell on you, but I'll not. Little Lassie was there and it was crying and she said, don't you start or I'll do the same to you. It still cried and she went to get a hold of its throat, but it growled at her. She said, now, now, don't be hasty. We went home and I took Little Lassie home and all. Norma was acting kind of funny and making twitchy faces and spreading her fingers out. She said, this is the first, but it'll not be the last. I was frightened then. I carried Lassie and put her down over the railway and we went to Crosswood Roadway. Norma went into the house and she got a pair of scissors and she put them down her pants. She says, go and get a pen. I said, no, what for? She says, to write a note on his stomach. And I wouldn't get the pen. She had a Gillette razor blade. It had Gillette on it. We went back to the blocks and Norma cut his hair. She tried to cut his leg and his ear with a blade. She tried to show me it was sharp. She took the top of her dress where it was raggy and cut it to make a slit. A man came down the railway bank with a little girl with blonde hair. He had a red checkered shirt on and blue denim jeans. I walked away. She hid the razor blade under a big square concrete block. She left the scissors beside him. She got out before me over the grass onto Scottswood Road. I wouldn't run on the grass because I had my black slippers on. When we got along a bit, she says, Mary, you shouldn't have done that because you'll get into trouble. And I hadn't done nothing. I haven't gotten the guts. I couldn't kill a bird by the neck or throat or anything. It's horrible. We went up the steps and went home. I was nearly crying. I said, if Pat finds out, she'll kill you. Never mind killing Brian because Pat's more like a tomboy. She's always climbing in the old buildings and that. Later on, I was helping to look for Brian, and I was trying to let on to Pat that I knew where he was on the blocks, but Norma said, he'll not be over there, he never goes there, and she convinced Pat that he wasn't there. I got shouted in about half past seven and stayed in. I got woke up about half past eleven, and we stood at the door as Brian had been found. The other day, Norma wanted to get put in a home. She says, will you run away with us? And I said, no. She says, if you get put in a home and you feed the little ones and murder them, then run away again. 
I have read the above statement. I've been told that I can correct, alter, or add anything I wish. This statement is true. I've made it of my own free will. Signed, Mary Flora Bell. Okay, it's clear that this is a child making these statements. It's all over the place. It's disjointed. It's confusing. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but what police believe is she told a lot of truths in this statement. And then she also kind of made a lot up of it. They believe that, you know, really she was the ringleader and Norma just kind of went along with it. But I mean, I guess we'll never really know. And even while Mary tried to blame the whole thing on Norma, police really did believe that Mary was the ringleader. Still, both Norma and Mary were arrested and charged with murder. Investigators now looked at the mysterious death of Martin Brown, the little boy who had apparently taken pills and died, as a homicide. But also, Mary herself had pretty much told everyone that she could that she was the one who had killed Martin, but nobody had listened to her until now. Now, it was clear that she had murdered both Brian and Martin. Both girls were in jail awaiting trial, and the guards noted some really strange and disturbing behavior by Mary. While tightly grabbing a stray cat by the neck, a guard told her not to hurt the cat, and Mary allegedly replied, Oh, she doesn't feel that, and anyway, I like hurting little things that can't fight back. In another incident, a policewoman said that Mary said she'd like to be a nurse because, quote-unquote, Then I can stick needles into people. I like hurting people. Mary Bell and Norma Bell were brought to trial for the murder of Martin Brown and Brian Howe on December 5, 1968. The trial would last nine days, and as you can imagine, it was a media frenzy. At trial, there was a psychiatrist who had examined Mary and spoke of her mental state, and he said, I think that this girl must be regarded as suffering from psychopathic personality, demonstrated by a lack of feeling quality to other humans, and a liability to act on impulse and without forethought. As for Norma, she was portrayed almost as a victim herself for being under the control of Mary. In court, they would say, In Norma, you have a simple, backward girl of subnormal intelligence. In Mary, you have a most abnormal child, aggressive, vicious, cruel, incapable of remorse. A girl, moreover, possessed of a dominating personality with a somewhat unusual intelligence and a degree of cunning that is almost terrifying. The jury took under four hours to return a verdict. Norma was found not guilty of manslaughter on both counts. Mary Bell was found guilty of manslaughter because of diminished responsibility, quote unquote, in both Martin and Brian's death. She received a sentence of detention for life, which at the time was basically an indefinite sentence of imprisonment. Seems kind of crazy to me that one child would be found guilty and the other would not, considering they both seem to have played a big role in it. Mary would spend nine years in jail, and then she briefly escaped from an adult prison. She would get caught, though, be put back in, and would finally be released for good in 1980 after serving two more years in prison. She was 23 years old. She was given a new name and a new identity to start a new life. Of course, there was a lot of controversy over this. Many people didn't think that it was fair that these two boys were now dead and Mary was free to live her life without consequence. Her first job out of jail was in a local children's nursery. Yeah, but the probation officers deemed this inappropriate work for her. Uh, you don't say. She then took waitressing jobs and attended a university, but she was too discouraged to stick with it. In 1984, she would have a daughter who would also be given a new identity. Mary's daughter didn't have any clue about her mother's crimes until she was 14 and kind of accidentally found out. A tabloid paper was able to track Mary down. A bunch of news trucks sat outside their home waiting to catch a glimpse of Mary and her daughter. And the family, they had to escape from their home with bed sheets on their heads. Can you imagine being a teenager and then finding out your whole life is pretty much a lie and that your mother killed two little boys when she was younger? It kind of reminds me of Carla Homolka, who is pretty much living a brand new life, has a new identity, is married, has kids. I just can't imagine finding out that your mother is a murderer. Now, it should be noted that Mary never went on to kill again. 
She seems to have been reformed, even though she literally was put into prison as a child instead of going to a mental facility where she could maybe get help for her situation. And it all goes back to the question of nature versus nurture. Do you think Mary would have ever killed if not for her upbringing? If not for being prostituted by her mother, horribly abused and neglected, if there was some sort of early intervention? And then what do you think about Norma being found not guilty of manslaughter while Mary was found guilty? Does that make sense to you? Does that seem fair? Do you think that Mary was the ringleader or do you think that Norma played a larger role than most people think? That's it for me tonight. I would once again like to thank my sponsor. Make sure you visit mystichippiestudio.com. I have their link in my show notes. Go enter code MHS15 at checkout for 15% off your first order. As for me, if you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can also search for me on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper, or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. If you'd like to become a patron and unlock some badass bonuses, make sure you visit patron.podbean.com slash Serial Napper. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye. <laughs>